week number 23. The title is The Cross. Matthew chapter 16, 24 through 25, and probably my favorite verse of the Bible question. So it says that also in Luke, did you just do Luke? You and uh, the you and Alex Galatians. No, it's, it's the you did that one too. But what Matthew 16 says is the same exact thing that Luke says that you just did, Luke 9, 23. Yeah. It says, Jesus said to his disciples, if you would come after me, let it, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For he who would save his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Right? Let anyone who would come after me take up his cross and follow me daily. I think Luke says daily. Matthew doesn't. There might be versions in Matthew that says daily. It says, take up your cross and follow me daily. Daily. Not just once. Right? Luke 9.23. Are you looking at it? Yeah. Is it the same one? It's the new living. Right. But it's about taking up your cross, right? right. Yeah, yeah, if they want to follow me. To be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross daily and follow me. Yep. You must give up. That's in Luke 9.23. Same. It's actually... As far as words that come out of Jesus' mouth, it's probably the most repeated thing that he said in all the Gospels. If you're wanting to follow me, take up your cross. Okay. Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Right. And then you've got Galatians 2. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but he who lives in him. Right. And I will go on living in this place of body, my trust in the Son of God, who loved me and gave me to yeah. My old self was crucified. That's what, gave this, that's, what, that's what this teaching is about. It's not about two pieces of wood nailed together or rope together. You know what I'm saying? It's about the true meaning of us, right? So, the most important question you'll ever answer is who is Jesus? Whatever, you, and whatever your answer is to that question, it's the most important answer you'll ever give in your life. So, so in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is more or less halfway through his three and a half years of ministry. Right? Matthew, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, I think, is 28 chapters long. Um, so 16 is not exactly halfway, but the first few chapters is at his three and a half years of ministry. Right? So by the time you get to this, he's halfway through. He's halfway to the cross, right? So, him and the uh, disciples, they're, they're hiking in Caesarea Philippi. Okay? And Jesus asked them this simple question in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. So, right before this, he asked them, Who do people say I am? Sorry, I've got sinuses and stuff, you guys. Who do people say the Son of Man is? how he said it, right? And they respond. He asked a specific question. Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they respond. Is anybody familiar with this on the record? John, John the Baptist, baptized. great prophet, Jeremiah, Elijah, they respond in kind. You don't need to what? Everybody's been saying this whole time. Oh, it's a great, great prophet for God, you know? Yeah. So then, in verse 15, <laughs> <laughs> In verse 15, right before this, he says, okay, who do you say I am? And Peter steps up. Right? The loud now. The leader of the twelve. Peter. Right? <laughs> he says, you are the Messiah. The son of the living God. And he was spot on. And Jesus quickly let him know that it was revealed to him by the Father. So Jesus says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for you have not learned this from any human being, but from my Father who is in heaven. Now I'm going to call you Peter, which means rock on that faith. On, on that rock, that pillar of faith that you just spoke out of your mouth, I will build my church. Right? So, he quickly reveals to him that, that he was 
rock. That'd be spot on. I am the Son of God. Right? This long awaited confession, which is anticipated in every single um, opening chapter of every gospel, right? At long last, the apostles confessed what we know today, right? What we should already know today. They weren't so sure about it. Does that make sense? Like, we're, too, we're fast forward 2,000 years. There's been one man in 2,100 years to stand tall to have, to have fulfilled all these prophecies, um, 60 specific ones, but probably hundreds of prophecies. Who knows dozens of minor prophecies. You know what I mean? Um, the only man to have said, I'm going to die, and in three days I'm going to raise again. I'll be resurrected. I will show you. Blah, 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 and then you'll see me go to the Father. He didn't say that he did tell me he was going to die, but this is, you know, before all that happened, they're not so sure. They're really not. Think about it. They're like, we're a product of our environment, too. So all these guys are here, and they're like, say, you're Jeremiah, you're Elijah, you're John the Baptist. You know? But finally, Peter speaks up, and he says, um, Jesus, you are Jesus. does know that Christ is a thing, right? It means the anointed. It just means the anointed. Jesus, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. Peter finally says that. And it's at this crucial moment that Jesus affirms Peter, Peter's confession. Um, but he also declares a clear positive things. So, we've talked about this before. They were expecting a conqueror. They were expecting a soldier. They were expecting the Messiah to come out with a daggum sword. You know what I mean? A big sword, a big shield, a spear as long as Zeus's lightning bolt, and he was going to ride two camels in the battle. Right? That's our Messiah. That dude can ride two camels with four of us. Did they not do last things back then? They did. They normally they called you what your whatever your name was. Um and like Simon Bar Jonah is Simon son of Joseph. So when he, when when Jesus is speaking to Peter, Simon was his real name. He changed his name to Peter. And he says, Blessed are you Simon Bar Jonah, Simon, son of Jonah. So but they did, they did have multiple names back then. Nobody knows. The only name we have for Jesus is Jesus. Right. So, this hits home with me every time, right? They were <laughs> looking for a soldier. They were looking for somebody to come in and conquer, right? <laughs> Jesus did not come to kill his or their enemies. Come to kill us here because he came to die for huh? The Jews did. Everybody around Jesus, Jesus probably didn't see anybody as him whatsoever. You know what I'm saying? Right. But, but Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Nathaniel, Matthias, Matthew, Levi. Judas, two Judas, I think, another Simon. So you had Simon Peter and another Simon. They were all like devout Jews. And at that time, the Jews were being oppressed. And they were like, and they've been oppressed most of their life. Pretty much all of it. They'd only been a free nation a few times. King David was really the, the like, the fruit of that, you know. And on into King Solomon, but then it was like, northern tribes were like, deuces. You guys are crazy. We're, we're kicking it all down the street. Then they get uh, exiled to Babylon. Just falls apart, you know. So they're like ready for the Messiah to come in and free them physically. But he didn't come to kill his enemies. He came to die for them. 
Jesus died for the one that hates you the most. Think about your life, man. Like, who is it that? If, if there is somebody, I, I pray every day that nobody actually hates me. Who is it that's like, they just got something against you, or there's just something about you they don't like? Jesus died for me. You know what I mean? We have to start thinking like that. Right? Right? We can't just disregard them because they harbor hate or bitterness or resentment. We have to love on them, edify them. We have to try to be a light to them. Right? Jesus pointed out his divine destiny and death. Peter, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 22, this is tough right here. This is how Peter reacts when Jesus says, Jesus says, I have to die not only for you, but for them. Peter says, this is what, I, I, can't, I don't know what translation this is. Far be it from you, my Lord, this shall never happen to you. That's what the Bible says. What, what the words that actually, like the trans, the old language, what Peter really says was bull. <laughs> That's what he said to Jesus. He said bull. That ain't never, he's like, what are you thinking? Can't nobody kill you, bro. That's what he says, right? The original Greek wording, this is what the guy says in his book. The original Greek wording is much stronger than our English translation. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But this, this is what Jesus says to him, which is probably the harshest thing Jesus ever said to anybody. And he says it to his number one disciple. Get behind me, Satan. When Peter said bullcrap, You'll never die. Get behind me, Satan. No, no Called him Satan, bro. Or put him on the same lead You know what I mean? Get behind me, Satan. Oddly enough, the ignorant crowds were closer in their confession than Peter. While the populace demand uh, damned him, Peter's protest could have derailed him. Okay, so like the crowds, they were like, the people that were getting mad at Jesus, they want to kill him or whatever, but Peter, like what Peter said, if you think about it, if he would have took that, if he hadn't have stood firm and said, behind me, behind me, bro, I ain't hearing that right now. That could have derailed Jesus from his mission, which was cross. Right? I like this part right here. Jesus' rebuke placed Peter in the same category as the demons Jesus had silenced earlier when they confessed that they knew his identity. So earlier in the Gospels, the demons are like, what do you want with us, Son of God? You know, they knew who he was as soon as he walked up on them, right? Jesus was harsh but unfair. Satan's confrontation with Jesus during the temptation ran precisely the same track. The devil was trying to derail Jesus from his mission. If he could get Jesus to turn that stone into bread and give up, like get him to go against what God was telling him to do, kick him off his path, he wins. Right? That's what Peter, without knowing it, that's what Peter was doing. He was trying to derail Jesus from his mission. He just had he had no idea how severe, like what he said was. You know what I'm saying? He got him to use his power and prestige to sort, short circuit the cross, he would win, right? Rather than the gruesome call to sacrifice, Satan and Peter, in a sense, was urging Jesus to assert his divine privileges to avoid the human experience of pain and suffering. And that's why Judas betrayed him to begin with. If you ask, I still believe that. I do. I believe that. Jesus, uh, Judas was trying to get Jesus to assert his divinity in the situation, in that moment right there. He was like, as soon as they bound him up, put a sword in his throat, he'll call down and pour some angels. It never happened. And he was like, man, was I wrong. Huh? You need a place to hang your head, a shoulder's better than a knot. This temptation is hardly new. It goes all the way back. Uh, oh, what we were just speaking of when the northern tribes divided from, from the southern tribes in Israel in 930 BC. So God had Israel, this nation, 
they were going to proclaim him. They, they were they were his people, his holy people. And all of a sudden, something derails him and they split. Right? So in 930 BC, if you track the historical review, but it's in um, Kings, Second Kings, let's see. First Kings is all about Saul, David, and Solomon, I think. So it'd be in Second Kings, I think. I think it's in Second Kings before. Judah splits from Jerusalem. But they split off, kind of like how the north and the south did here in America. Right? After Solomon's death, his son Rehoboam took the craft, the crown. His citizens assembled and they were pleading with him to reduce their taxes. Because Solomon, um, Solomon like slaves drove them, pretty much. You know what I mean? Tax the heck out of them, used them to build all kinds of crazy stuff. There's the temple, the temple, the temple courtyard. So like when you walked into the temple, just what was like like grassy area where, where uh, Jesus kicked over the tables and stuff was 25 football fields. 25, 25 football fields. Right? That's just the courtyard. So then you got the building. Right? It was huge. Massive. Um, so Rehoboam Asks his advisors, what do you think we should do? And he's got these young kids, like straight out of college, talking about, we went to MIT at home. You should tax them more, because then you'll make more money. And he's like, hmm, it's like you old guys over there. Like, Wake up. It's not that time. What do you think I should do? And they were like, if you are kind to your people, they will love you forever. And then they went back to sleep during their nap time. Nappy. I'm getting old. And I'm like, quit one that time. <laughs> Don't bother me. Give me, <laughs> give me my orders. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. Give me my orders original. But they told me, if you are kind to your people, and you're, they, you know, if you show them love and kindness, they will, they will love you and they will stay faithful to you forever. He goes, nah. Turns around and he goes, I'm going to tax you even more than my dad did. And they went. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're leaving, man. Let's get out of here. <laughs> Spanish. Damn it. I can never get the dialect right. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, Jehoshaphat, Paul, let's run. <laughs> I still can't get over that. What was their language? language? Like, Rehoboam. Jehoshaphat, Jeroboam, Shabbat, Dave. <laughs> what was it, Arabic? <laughs> what the heck? Like, what were they drinking? You know? Is it Arabic they speak? Uh, Aramaic. Oh, uh, well, in, nine, in 930 BC, they were speaking Hebrew. They, I'm pretty sure they were speaking Hebrew. Yeah. You know. But, he's like, um, He's, and he says this. Oh, I'm sorry. It is in First Kings, at the, in the middle of First Kings. He says, "My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to that." And their burden got heavier and heavier. And because of that, the people of the northern tribes crowned another guy king, not Rehoboam, but Jeroboam. And this dude, like, he didn't want them to go down there to Jerusalem to worship at the temple, so he sets up. Golden statues of donkeys and cows and this, that, and other to try to get them to worship in the land so that they don't, like, I guess, jump sides maybe or don't get killed or who knows what is, who knows what his compromise was. You know what I mean? Compromise. The same thing we battle with every day. Compromise. Man, man, I'm just going to do this. Man, man, I'm just going to do this. We can't compromise. We can't, we can't. Can't stop walking the path that God's laid before us. Right? That's what he did. That's what Peter was, that's what, without knowing it, that's what Peter was saying to Jesus. You're not going to walk that path. It's bullcrap. I just told you who you were. Did you not hear me? I just said you're the Son of God. Now act like it. And he said, I am. I'm going to die for all That's tough, man. God, oh, that gets me in time. So he sets up um, statues and stuff. This leads the northern tribes into idolatry, of course. You know, um, it was his attempt to keep his people in his borders. That's what he was trying to keep the northern people 
in the northern part of, of Israel and not mix them, right? It was, um, it was definitely the wrong thing to do. He didn't want them going down into Jerusalem to worship. He was trying to keep them in the north, right? So we fast forward to, to Matthew 16. Jesus and his disciples. At this very moment, this is cool. So at this very moment, they are um, they are standing in the shadow of Jeroboam's um, <laughs> golden calves because they're actually in Dan, believe it or not. And that's where dudes, so in 930 BC he sets up a golden calf in the city of Dan. That's where Jesus and his disciples are standing when they when this is going on. Right? This is precisely why Jesus led them here, because he knew the apostles would understand where they were and what had happened more than nine hundred years earlier. Jews were serious about their history. If you can't tell by reading your Bible, they were serious about their history. So when Jesus took them to that spot, they knew. They knew what happened there. They knew that that's the spot where he started, where they split. The northern, they were like, well, this is when our nation split, and we were exiled, we were in ruins. That's why we're where we're at today. You think they forgot about that? No. You know? They knew. This is where Israel had been derailed. Jesus returned to where the king of Israel took the wrong advice. Right? So now return with me to Rehoboam and the older men whose advice he swore. The old men. Their advice was, if you will be a servant to, the, to these people today and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. Okay? So though he scorned that advice, Jesus intended to follow. As we can see from his reply to Peter, he intended to take Israel back to that moment and reunify the tribes under a different kind of leadership. Right? So as soon as as soon as he rebukes Peter, which I think was in verse 22, he says, get behind me, Satan. For Peter says, bull crap, you're never going to die in verse 22. And he says, get behind me, Satan. Jesus then says this. If anyone would come after him, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow him. For whosoever will save his life will live him. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find him. So when he says that, he stops. Like, so literally, before that, they were talking about Jesus dying for his enemies and him going to the cross. And Peter's like, you're not going to die. And all of a sudden, Jesus flips it on its head. Now he's talking about them. He's no longer talking about his death. He's talking about their death. Right? He's talking about their death. Check this out. I, I highlighted this. This is cool. <laughs> This is what he says right here. The core requirement for a Christian. To be a Christian, you have this is it. This is the core. You have to have it. Crucifixion. That's tough right there. The core requirement for a Christian <coughs> is crucifixion. Right? What was we talking about? I bless about you. Ago, uh, Spencer, about how that cross is a reminder. He doesn't call us to wear his cross as jewelry. Yeah. He didn't say, wear my cross on your neck so that everybody can see. Right? It's like a reminder. Every morning I wake up, I'm carrying. Everything that I'm going through that day. You know, yep. When I when I look at it, bro, yes, it has the Lord's Prayer on there, but I can't see that good, so I really can't see <laughs> it anyway. But when I see, when I see the cross, like if I'm in the mirror brushing my teeth or something, literally it reminds me every time of the cross. The Amen. <laughs> this man, he was a man. He was God. He came as a man. 
gave up all Amen. of his divinity and died for everyone. Everyone. No. <laughs> I'm not it's like no. I'm not doing that. Sorry, bud. <laughs> like that's I, I don't know, man. I, I don't maybe maybe I would. I don't know. I don't think I would do it. When they started whipping me with that daggum uh, whip with the cat with the metal with the cat of nine tails. When they started hitting me with that about the second time I was like, I'll say, I'm I'll listen, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was just kidding. Bro, Time out. Game off. Like, why are you guard? Game off. <laughs> I I like, I hit myself with a whistle and left a red mark around my neck. Bro, I ain't like, yeah, like, I'm like, no. You ever been spiked with an extension cord? Yes. Yeah, you get spiked three times with one whack? No. That's an extension <laughs> Like, this thing was cutting his skin. Chuck. You know, it's like, ah. I'm going to be like, okay, fine, fine. <laughs> Why don't you out. take a joke? You misunderstood me. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I'm just saying, like, I don't know. I don't know. He did it. He did it. Once our memory hearts, he despised the shame. Right? He uh, uh, surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses to make sure that we lay down the sin that uh, easily attracts us. And with all joy, he went to the cross, despised the shame, right? He did that. He did that. So, we are not, we are not called to, like, just remember him, or, like, it is symbolic, but we're not called to just be, be symbols, we're called to action, right? I didn't, I've heard this before, but I couldn't remember it. We are called to follow his steps on the Via Della Rosa. Does everybody know what that is? The Via Della Rosa. That's the name of the little street that he walked his cross up. Going to Galgotha. Going to the, uh, uh, the what do they call it? Storm Mountain? Lace and Galgotha. That's Via Della Rosa. That's the name of the street he walked down. We're called to follow that. We're called to take up a cross. Right? Before he was crucified, he commanded his followers to take up their own crosses. After his crucifixion, Paul identified discipleship as cross-bearing. If you want to be a disciple, if you want to know Christ, if you want the mind of Christ, if you want to seek the heart of God, if you want to go to heaven, if you want to make an impact on people's lives, because it goes more than just that. You know what I'm saying? Like, like our eternal security is really what it's about. But what about your eternal security? What, like I'm, for some reason... <laughs> At some point, God will be like, just like, wake you up like a goldfish. I always tell people I got the memory of a goldfish every 30 seconds, it goes blank. You know? So I woke up one day and I cared more about your salvation than mine. That's going to happen at some point in your walk. Yeah. That's what He calls us to do, right? He says, I have, I have been crucified with Christ. And this is Paul talking. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself. The cross isn't merely, so the, the cross isn't something that Jesus did for us. He did do it for us. It's not something Jesus just did for us. It's something Jesus modeled for us. And you'll hear me say that over and over and over and over again. We should model our lives after this. Right? We literally should model our lives after this. Being a disciple is not just receiving it. That's a part of it. You have, to, you have to accept it. You have to believe in it. But it doesn't stop there. It's imitating it. So you've got to receive it and imitate it. Like, think about when you was a kid. Dude, when I was a kid, I loved Michael Gordon. I loved Michael Gordon. I'd go out in my backyard. I'd be out four seconds left, baby. Four seconds left on the clock. Jordan, <laughs> it's out. Oh, crap. You know what I mean? <laughs> what do you think Jesus wants from you? Four seconds left on the clock, baby. Four seconds left on the clock. 
There's still two people in line at the soup kitchen. ain't been fed yet. Here we go, baby. Serve it, right? For real, think about that. It's the fourth quarter, and there's still two people that don't have a place to stay. Let's find them a shelter or something. Right. If, you, if you really idolize something, you're going to act like them, right? I don't know if I could play in those daggone group <coughs> efforts or so. I don't think I could. I'd get in trouble on Sundays. I'd strap up both straps, and I'd get charged for working on Sunday. You're working on the Sabbath. Man, I ain't going to let them. I'm tying my shoes. I think you lace my straps up. <laughs> you strapped up. <laughs> You know what I mean? Think about it. We have to imitate. I used to imitate all the all the professional athletes. You know what I mean? I wanted I wanted to play sports for the longest time. Up until about freshman sophomore year of college. When everybody on the team was six, seven, two forty and they were faster than me, bigger than me, could jump higher than me, and I was like, fine. <laughs> I was like, forget this. <laughs> you know? Like, play poker. I should have. I played water. Play I should have played cricket. <laughs> I played checkers and chess. I played cricket more and hit the ball out behind you, play it. Hit the ball through the table. No, that's crochet. Right? That's from crochet. No, yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> Croquet. <laughs> 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 Professional croquet. Cricket, cricket's a baseball. Oh, yeah, that's right with the flat back. Yeah. But like a paddle. <laughs> like a paddle in elementary school. <laughs> the gruesome reality of crucifixion isn't easy to talk about. In fact, we know surprisingly little about this ancient mode of execution. Precisely because it was so shameful. It was not to be discussed. In public, people didn't talk about it. You know, perhaps that's why the clearest description of the practice of crucifixion outside of the Gospels, one of my favorites, comes from Psalm 22. <laughs> Psalm 22 was written, I mean, it was written in, the crucifixion was invented in either 300 or 200 BC, and that was written in 1000 BC. That, that, this was written six to eight hundred years before crucifixion was even invented. Right? In that psalm, uh, Jesus says this when he's dying. He says, my God, my God, why, you, why have you abandoned me? Why have you me? <laughs> it was composed a thousand years before Jesus. Oh, five hundred years before the Persians invented uh, crucifixion, not six hundred it details piercing of the hands, piercing of the feet, heart melting like wax. You should read it, dude. It's serious. It, it does. All this, all this is in there. Bones out of joint. Because when you when they when they hang you up on that thing, the first thing that happens is you fall forward and all your bones get dislocated. All of them. You know, you gotta literally stand up just to breathe and hold. It usually takes six days to die. It's horrible. It, it is. It is. And this is, I've looked it up. Um, to this day, it's the most horrible, painful way of death that any human has ever been. And then it's time for you to die, you will be subject to break your hand bones. So you can't stand up anymore. Because, because when, when you're on that thing, when you're on that thing, literally it's suffocating you to death using your own body weight. And so you like lean up or try to sit up, you know? And to make sure you're dead, that's why they do that. Yeah, that's yeah, why they do that. Yeah. Um, Psalm 22 also talks about his enemies surrounding him, them mocking him in public, them taking his clothes off and exposing him naked, them then throwing dice for his clothes. Yeah, he needs a new pair of robes. <laughs> you know? They did. They threw, they threw, it said cast lots. That's throwing dice. So they, they throw dice for all the folks in Right? And it also talks about his extreme thirst. When we talk about how thirsty he was, and they put that uh, vinegar. vinegar stuff on that sponge and try to feast him and get him to drink it. That's all in Psalm 22. It's written a thousand years before Jesus. It's written 500 years before crucifixion was even invented. They didn't even know it was. Right? Um, so it, it's. And it, it's a description of 
crucifixion, which is obviously uncomfortable uh, to let alone speak about. So, like in that culture, it, they would sit there and watch it, but they wouldn't talk about it outside of that. Equally uncomfortable should be our own execution. Perhaps it's not something we want to talk about, but we need to. What are we going to die to? What is it in your life that you mean to kill? For real. Like, would you guys hear when the dude, Old fleshly dude was still kind of out of his head, but I said you had to kill yourself to, oh, I said we had to die to ourselves. He said, what? I said, you had to kill yourself to be saved. And he <coughs> took me literally. Was y'all, who all was in here? I was. Don't y'all remember? He was like, what? He's like, you got to commit suicide <laughs> to be saved. He was still high, I'm pretty sure. And I'm like, not physically, bro. Spiritually. Like, don't go to the bathroom for the next hour until you forget what I just said, you know. But yes, it's it's spiritual. It's a, it's not just spiritual, but like your desires, your lusts, your 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 this flesh. This stupid tag on mm. the stupid hard candy shit. <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> But this thing that it destroys us, man. It destroys us because we let it dictate what we do. Right? We let it dictate what we do, what we say. You have to you have to crucify that. There's all kinds of stuff we have to crucify, not just one thing, not just you know, it's a daily thing too. That's why I like Luke's version where he says, uh, take up your cross and follow me daily. Daily. Right? Um, Jesus said if we don't take up a cross, that we are unable to follow him. Matthew chapter 10, verse 38. I forgot about that. Let's see if that's really what that says. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. Oh! Dang it! I forgot about that one. Matthew chapter 10, verse 38. It's just like in the Gospel of John when he says, if you refuse to forgive, my Father will refuse to forgive you. Forgive you. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. Like, come on, man. That's tough. We must... Whoa, 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 whoa. I've been talking about zombies the past couple of weeks. <laughs> Literally, the book says we must live as the walking dead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, crap. <laughs> I'm serious, bro. Like, could you imagine how freaked out them people was to see all these people that they know was dead running around town? That's probably the first instance of a zombie apocalypse ever married. No, she brought Frankenstein. I was going to say Mary Shelley. Don't worry about that. Come on. Wrong author. <laughs> we must live as the walking dead. <laughs> Only then will we be able to conquer our sinful passions. Self control is one of the fruits of the Spirit, right? we can conquer our sinful passions, we would be operating in self-control. So, conquering our sinful passions, that's something that we know we have to do. You know it. Whether you're doing it or not, you know it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't care what you believe in, when you're out there, even if you didn't believe in God, because I didn't, I didn't believe in God, but I still, I turn around and I'll be like, this is destroying me. <laughs> Every, it's not just me, everything around me is falling apart. I mean, like, falling apart. It's killing everything around me. I have to stop this. I have to quit. I have to, you know, like, it was something that I knew, but there's something more than that. There's something more important and more impressive. Jesus' death saved our souls. 
we sing this at church, we hear it from the pulpit when the preacher preaches sermons. We thank God for His grace in sending His Son to save us for eternity. So what's the purpose of our cross? What's the purpose of our cross? What is the purpose of our cross? What's the purpose of our cross? It's not simply self-denial to build self-control. That's part of it. That's part of it, but there's more than that. Hold on, I got one of those. They were all I That's really what it's about because That's hard. Why, why do you want to get hot? Because it feels good. Why do you want to get with a chick? Well, I'm trying to find the right girl for me. Why do you want to get with a chick? Stop playing. That woo woo. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> Eric ate all the pumpkin pies. I was a woo woo pies. Yeah. Like, you know, it feels good. It's our, it's your, <laughs> it's your pleasures. Pleasures, right? Yeah. That's what we, and we do. We seek it. We yeah. seek it. And learning to deny them. And stop not, like, you're not, for me, you're not always going to be able to just shut them off, but you can shut them up. Come on, how? Right? And that builds self-control, right? It's not to make a better version of us. Like Jesus' death, our suffering and our sacrifice have saving power. Who? Who? Let me say that again. Your suffering and your sacrifice has saving power. So does yours, so does yours, so does yours, so does yours, so yours, all of you. Your suffering, what? The times of trials, tribulations, the times of pain, the times of when I'm ready to give up, the times when I hate everything, I don't think I can make it, has saving power? Yes. Not just for you. It's not about you. Your sacrifice. The times where you wanted to go up and go to sleep, but you stayed down here to talk to somebody anyway because they needed it. Or the times where you wanted to go to the store or whatever, whatever, but you stayed to help with chores or help extra duty tests, whatever. The things you sacrificed, the time you wanted to go do something, but you're going on Wednesday night, you're going to make sure, even though you're going to be tired, working how, many, how long you're working, you're going Wednesday night to the uh, cleansing train. Yeah. You're sacrificing your time for, them, for God. You know what I'm saying? I'm just saying, like, these are, when I say sacrifice, I'm not talking about why jumping in front of a bullet for somebody, that might be part of it, but your time, your money, your effort, your your ear, when you lend your ear to somebody, you're sacrificing your self-gratification because you can't tell me there ain't something you'd rather be doing. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're sacrificing. It has, it holds within it saving power. Saving power for the, for, for everybody. For everybody who's around you because it rubs off. They see it. Your fruit hits the ground and they start picking it up and eating it and tasting it. Mm. Right? Amen. For real. You know? Light, lights shine. That's what they do. They shine. Dude, I'll be sitting in my house. I'm serious, man. I'll be sitting in my house and like, I'll wake up and I can't go back to sleep and it's the daggum lizard, the dragon in there. His door will be cracked open, and he's got them heat lamps that don't ever shut off, right? Because he's got to be able to get up there and get warm every now and then. His heat lamps don't ever shut off. They're not super bright because it faces down, and they're in a black lamp enclosure, and they face down. But just that little bit of light, I can't, because it creeps through my door, I have to shut my door. Light shines, bro. Light shines, man. I don't care how bright you think you are, you're shining. Come on. You know, you're shining. Our sacrifice and our suffering has saving power. 
for, for our whole society, for everybody in this room, for everybody in your family, for everybody in the town that you go to after this, for, for everybody. It ain't just for you. It ain't really about you. Right? As Jesus died to atone for our personal sins, so what's the purpose of our cross, right? The purpose of Jesus' cross was the atonement for our sins, right? We die to reverse the effects of sin on our family, community, nation. What's the purpose of your cross? Because every time somebody sees you carry your cross daily and sacrifice yourself for Jesus, you are reversing the effect of sin on them. You are rekindling something within them if they've known Jesus before. You are lighting something up inside of them that they've never known before if they didn't know who Jesus was. Right? There's saving power. Every minute you spend sitting in that seat learning how to deal with crack, but still come in here and try to get to know Jesus and have an intimate relationship with him? Because that's really what this is about. <laughs> like they send you guys to the go-kart tracks, these these uh, construction sites and stuff like that. They work. I'm serious, dude. You're like, oh, mate. it's frustrating. You know? Like, oh, I can't. Oh, 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 oh. But yet you still come back. You still keep coming back. Because something inside of you wants to know about Jesus. And at some point, the sacrifice the suffering what we're going through right now is going to explode on somebody's face. Grace bomb. Right? Grace bomb. I say. I say. Right now. Like. <laughs> 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 on a serious note <laughs> so as we in the church sacrifice ourselves if you think about it if the church concentrated I like some of these things that he put I'm going to talk about it a little bit so if, if the church made a sacrifice and concentrated solely on foster care what would happen to foster children they would find home <laughs> it would eliminate foster care Right? Think about that. It would eliminate foster care. If the church focused their money and attention, they sacrificed everything else they got going on and focused solely on malaria, which is one of the diseases he brings up, which is still almost a million people, more than COVID, anyway. <laughs> it's a, uh, so it's a bite. It's not a bacteria. From it's a, a mosquito. It's a virus. It's an infection or something like a mosquito or something like that bites you. And it's a blood transfusion type thing where you get sick. Like literally, there's all there's medicine for it, but there's people in the world that still die from it today. They would have like no more malaria. We did it with smallpox. So smallpox from like twelve hundred to nineteen eighty killed six hundred million people. I might be a, lo a little off on that. Million six hundred million, and in 1980, somebody got on the news. I think it was who was the CDC. Right? The CDC. Right? The CDC. <laughs> he said, "Guess what? We're having a party. Smallpox is gone, and the, and the the entire Earth's population has not seen a case of smallpox since 1980. So it can be done, right? If we focus all our attention on it, right? Um." Only in the church is there a realistic hope of eradicating racism. Only in Christ have Jews and Greeks, slaves and free, male and female, been united in fellowship and purpose. The list can go on and go on and go on and go on and go on. We know this is true because we have a track record that's impressive. Beginning with the first century church, the greatest social strides in culture, art, medicine, compassion, education, poverty, and the protection of women and children, 
and the marginalized and the outcasts or the homeless, whatever you want to call them, the poor, have come primarily from those with one of those on their back. So when, when a hurricane hits in the Gulf, or when a tsunami hits over in Haiti, or when tornadoes tear through Oklahoma, who shows up? The Red Cross. Who shows up? National Guard. God. Christians. I thought you were talking about the police. Christians. Because you can work for Red Cross, <laughs> you can work for the National Guard, and they they will make you go. But who shows up on their own? Literally, think about it. How many you got some people that have you heard, time. oh, we're going to do this. Oh, we're going to do this. Dude, when, that, when Katrina hit, yeah. I wasn't a Christian yet, right? So when Katrina hit, there was like 30 people that I ran into that's like, we're going down to New Orleans. I'm like, you're, everybody's dying. Why would you go? They're all running up here. You're going to go running down there? I'm like, yeah, we're going to go help them bring you. They've got different people take, that take their boats down and start searching houses on their own free they were, they were people from the churches. You know, I, I didn't get real, real, real deep into it because I didn't want to hear anything they had to say. You know what I mean? Like once they started talking about Jesus, I started walking away. But it was weird that like God let certain things like that happen in my life because now I can see it. And it's like, dude, FEMA might be there, Red Cross might be there, National Guard might be there. But I guarantee you there's going to be groups of Christians there every time. Every time. They'll fly across the world. Like, like if you look at the globe, it looks like this, and you're going to fly and land on that and help people and come back. No. No. If I can ride my bike across that co the whole country in a minute and a half, I'm not going. <laughs> like, most likely everything there is going to be out to kill you. <laughs> They'll go. They'll go. They'll go to the smallest islands, the smallest countries. They're called, they, they sacrifice, they sac literally sacrifice their lives. So I guess, yeah. Because like, I'm, I joke a lot, you know what I mean? But I, dude, I would go. I would be sacrificing my life, wouldn't I? Well, then mosquitoes bite me. I'm going to give me one of the tents that's around you all the time. Yes. <laughs> like, I'm only going to unzip it if I have to answer your question. <laughs> like, with a little flap that I can hit. Like, give me my burger. I bet they don't have burgers. Dang it. <laughs> that would be my luck. Go to a country that don't have burgers. That's not good. They probably do. It's just made out of plants. <laughs> I'm down with that, I guess. Have you ever, have you guys ever had a black bean burger? They're delicious. What's wrong with you? Axel Rose, where have you been? <laughs> that are good, man. We had them at Park Vista when I worked up there. And I was like, man, I don't know, man. I don't know. They're good. Soybean burger? These, they were black bean with rice and corn and something else. Yeah. They were good. Huddle House has them. Yeah, nice burger. <laughs> <laughs> That's why when I was on American. <laughs> what? At the zoo. So in a little, uh, no, it's, they have a lot of restaurants. Okay, I'll put that burger in the bag on the display. Where do you get this burger? On American. No. What the heck? <laughs> oh man. The ones I had were good, man. I don't know. Maybe if they're like cooked very, very well. I mean, you, they're, 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 they're vegetables. They're you don't have to cook them. You just want to be hot. Think about it. Well, like crispy or something? <laughs> kind of like chocolate. Mm -hmm. Chocolate. Marvel. Oh, chocolate. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. So, this circles back to our original question. Who do you say Jesus is? If he's merely a prophet from the past, a hero of our faith, we likely have missed the purpose of the Messiah. Suffering and sacrifice were his greatest achievements. Not the miracles, 
Not the healing the lame, healing the lepers. His greatest, his number one purpose, his greatest achievement was to atone for our sins, to die. To die. To die. As his disciples, this should be yours as well. Amen. If you confess him as your Lord, you are obligated to follow God. him. Jesus Christ. This is tough for me right here. How can you celebrate, honor, glorify, or worship a God that you won't imitate? That you're not willing to act on? Oh, we love you, bud. No, we whatever. Yeah. We're willing to do that, but we can't imitate the one that created us. The one that sent himself and human flesh to die for our sins so that we may live with him eternally. He gives us picture after picture after picture after picture. Why? Of what to do. How to act. Half the Bible is what not to do. So it depends on how you learn. Can you learn by somebody saying, here, do this? Yes. Don't do that. What's the first thing you do? Jimmy, don't do that. <laughs> Are they looking? <laughs> That's the first thing you want to do. She never told me not to do it. Right? You alright? Yeah. I love you, bro. Alright. Chris, you want to pray this out?